Thank you so much. I guess that needs a little pruning, <laughs> that CAPS profile. Um, thank you so much. Will you save me time because I don't have to introduce who I am. But basically, I'm a psychiatrist and for the last um, 15 years have been doing mostly cognitive behavior therapy in the outpatient clinics here. Um, and I also am uh, what's called a neuropsychiatrist, which not um, everybody knows it's a it's a subspecialty that's kind of the interface between neurology and psychiatry. But most of my time is really spent doing cognitive behavior therapy. So I'm just kind of a weird psychiatrist that's doing multiple things. But um, I got into this virtual reality subject because my research interest was in psychosomatic illnesses and was trying to develop more motor and sensory interventions for um, these problems and um, began an exploratory pilot study using virtual reality. And as I got immersed in that, um, I, I found all these applications and this rich research that's been going on for the last 20 years and started to experiment applying it in uh, cognitive behavior therapy as part of cognitive behavior therapy. Um, and I have just been doing this for, for about four or five years, so I'm not an expert, and it's a very wide field. So I'm going to do my best to um, just kind of give you the highlights of everything, but just know there's it's much deeper than I can even... Um, express during this um, uh, 50 minutes. But hopefully, um, I look forward to most the interactive part when we have the question and answer. So I'll try to go as quickly as possible through um, the knowledge component, and then um, we can have as many uh, questions as possible. That's always the most fun and most um, meaningful. Um, so I'm going to break it up into just giving you a primer on the basics of virtual reality and then talk about um, the long history of the traditional VR um, for mental illness and then this new technology um, that um, uh, you're probably hearing about and be, uh, because of all the technology developments, there's this embodied VR and I'll tell you what impact this has for the future of um, possible treatments for psychiatric illness. Um, so um, let's just start with virtual reality basics. Um, so if you read, um, if you really want to dive into the subject, there's Jaron Lanier um, who wrote um, The Dawn of the New Everything. I'll tell you, he's one of the founders um, and first coined the term, I believe, virtual reality. Um, and um, I think the consensus now is that it's anything that's a computer-generated 3D um, experience. And um, it usually is a head-mounted display that you wear, and it um, picks up movement of some type. Um, and it can um, incorporate uh, mostly visual and auditory, but it can also incorporate other senses like touch and vibration and um, smell. Um, and it's usually a life-size um, experience where you really feel like you've been taken somewhere else. And this is different than augmented reality, and I'll be talking to you a little bit more about the difference uh, with augmented reality. So basically, um, this headset, and here's one of them kind of right here, um, and it, it measures um, these... Uh, traditional headsets really measure the three um, axes of the head, your head movements. And um, what it does is replace visual reality, which usually um, our visual capture system really informs and is a very robust system that has uh, a lot of influence over what we believe and what we feel emotionally. So it, um, we replace that and the only reality coming in are your, is your head movement and where that is in space. And that informs the computer-generated um, uh, system or input, which then can um, evoke beliefs and emotions. So the, uh, there's some jargon you probably just need to know. It's not as complicated as it sounds. The sense of presence is a term that's um, thrown around a lot with VR. It just means 
your experience, your psychological experience of being there, of just that really being somewhere else. And it, um, in research and social science, it's kind of broken into three categories, social, um, your, your social presence, with, which is um, how realistic it feels interacting with other people um, in, in the environment. Then there's the spatial sense of presence, um, how realistic um, and how much you feel that you're in this uh, new space. And then there's your self-present, how much you feel ownership over an avatar or a body that you're inhabiting if you're, um, if you're having that. So, um, and it's usually at this point considered sort of um, how robust the device is, how, how well it gives you a sense of presence. So it's sort of the um, um, gold standard for VR um, is how quickly you can get this sense of presence. I hope that makes sense. Um, yeah, it's too bad we can't have this interactive because then if you had questions, you could ask me. Usually I do my talks like that, so it's a little different for me not to, not to stop for questions, but I'll get used to it. Um, and so there's these presence measures um, that are used in research. Uh, and the second one, the Whitmer and Singer one, is probably the one that's used most often. We don't know what it's correlated with yet, so um, at least from the reading that I've done. So I wouldn't take it too um, seriously, but it's just you'll see measures of presence. Um, and then this term immersion, which is just um, the device's capability of creating presence and just a sense of being there. Um, and usually it takes people about five to six, se um, six seconds to feel immersed and there, which is pretty remarkable. Um, so our multimodal sensor, sensory system is capable of readjusting quite quickly. Um, and then um, some really important um, aspects to think about with VR basics is you can have different perspectives. So um, the most common is the first person perspective, this egocentric viewpoint, the one that we're usually feeling um, where you're seeing things from your own viewpoint. So this um, slide is, um, for example, a parent maybe learning um, parenting skills will um, have um, an experience of being themselves, talking to um, their offspring, and um, trying out new communication skills. Um, so sort of the um, being John Malkovich um, experience, if you've seen that movie, where people could beam into this one person's body and have that experience. So that's the, the first person point of view. Um, but it also has the ability to um, bring in the second point of view. So you could watch yourself from the other person's perspective. You could, we could actually create an experience where you're watching yourself do the skill from maybe your daughter or son's perspective. So that's a second person allocentric viewpoint. And in psychology, there's a lot of attention right now to this theory of mind and uh, the ability to be able to take different perspectives. And there's different um, conditions that have um, strengths and weaknesses in, in this area. Um, the other um, point of view is the allocentric point of view, which is a third person point of view. You can also create the experience so you're looking at both of you interacting. Um, and we know from trauma work and linguistics that usually when people tell their narrative from a third person rather than a first person, um, it seems to be more helpful. Um, and so, um, we, so there's potential here you can see um, for um, being able to um, capture and, and manipulate the theory of mind and perspectives. Um, and so the t um, hardware that's being used um, is varied and very cheap and available. You can get a cardboard, Google Cardboard, for like $3. Um, the, t the technology is really in the phones. It's, it's used with um, any type of phone. Um, and so you can, you can use something very um, basic like this with... Um, or you can, you know, have a really comfy one for like thirty dollars with foam, and this is kind of the Mercedes of, of um, headsets. Um, and so um, they're quite available um, as long as you have a phone. And 
so there's another type of virtual reality uh, or immersive reality called augmented or mixed reality. So this um, actually layers virtual reality on top of, of real reality or live information. So in this kind of setup, you can either add um, or take away information um, onto an experience. So that's, that's a bit different. So, okay, what are the VR treatments um, in mental illness currently and, and the research? Well, there's a few ways, and um, you can imagine probably just listening to, uh, about VR, people start to think of all these amazing ways you could apply it. Um, so, and what's been done so far is probably in about four categories that I'll, I'll talk about, uh, and I'll talk in more depth about each one. But the first one is exposure has been the most used. And so this is um, a part of, um, is a mechanism for desensitization. So people get sensitized to things, um, just like you get sensitized to allergens and um, maybe need allergy um, shots. People get sensitized to stimulus, to, to cues. Um, you can be born with a certain sensitivity. Um, and we know that exposure and desensitization is helpful. So virtual reality is able to be very specific and be personalized to cues. Um, the other uh, way that's been used for virtual reality um, um, really at the onset was uh, distraction. So for people uh, with acute pain, burn patients, Hunter Hoffman did some of the first studies on this, uh, found that people um, used less opiates, who were distracted um, using uh, virtual reality or playing games. Um, uh, you can also use it for emotional distress, to distract yourself. I know James Gross just gave a talk to our department and talked about the only way, there's only two things to do to regulate your emotions. He's the um, kind of um, uh, researcher on, on effective regulation and emotion, emotion regu regulation. He said, you know, when you're, um, when you're not overwhelmed, you can reappraise things and regulate your emotions and um, bring some negative emotions down. But when you're really overwhelmed, you really can't think. And so the only thing you can do is distract. So um, uh, virtual reality really um, allows you to distract when your own, even when you don't have access to your own imagination. Um, and so we can use it as well for stimulation for um, uh, those uh, folks that uh, are sensory deprived, like in geriatric settings, you can add this. We know that the brain needs a certain amount of uh, pleasure and mastery and novelty. We often say four pleasant activities a day to keep the blues away, uh, and people get understimulated and get depressed, so it can be used um, for that. Um, it, um, and then training. So what's really um, unique and cool about virtual reality is its um, effect on learning. So it enhances learning of any kind. Because it's so engaging, um, anything you learn in VR and interact with, you're going to retain more. So instead of um, having to listen to your therapist drone on and on about mindfulness, you could actually have a mindfulness experience and be taught how to do it and interact um, with it and um, have some specific feedback. So you're going to you're going to learn it. You're going to enjoy it. You're going to retain it more. And much of um, the treatment for um, mental illness is training and learning skills. Um, so diaphragmatic breathing. Um, it could also um, be used um, for s simulation learning for providers um, and for psychoeducation. And then the other um, big um, component is research. So because it, you can deliver standardized experiences, um, it, it can be very much more precise and allow rigorous studies to be done that are controlled. Um, it also can be used as a measurement tool, uh, like for eye gaze um, and um, avo uh, measuring avoidance behaviors and things like that. Um, and also, um, What's being developed currently is also interfaces between biofeedback and virtual reality, EEG and virtual reality. So there's many, many possibilities. There's probably many more than I'm, I'm saying here, but these are the, probably the most common currently. 
And I was flabbergasted that there is about 20 years of data for VR for uh, multiple um, illnesses. And I didn't learn any of these in psychiatry um, in my residency or even um, after residency when I thought I was keeping up with the literature. Um, mostly the, uh, the, the field of psychology has um, really um, been the ones to develop this. Um, and mostly for anxiety disorders. Um, so we've got, um, you know, social anxiety, four controlled trials, panic and agoraphobia, five controlled um, trials, uh, fear of flying, two controlled trials, spider phobia, two controlled trials. And there's many other trials. I'm just giving you the most robust um, uh, level of evidence that we have, which is pretty good because so, um, many of our other psychotherapies don't even have this level of evidence. For addiction, um, we just have one on smoking, um, and um, there's some studies in the pipeline, um, and I know um, some internal studies by companies that look very promising, and I know in China um, they have some studies, um, and they use um, VR a lot in, in addiction programs. Um, and then pain, uh, for acute pain uh, with burn patients, uh, as I said, Hunter Hoffman had a controlled trial. PTSD and trauma, we have three controlled trials. Eating disorders and obesity, four. Um, autism and social skills training, just recently two came out. Um, for schizophrenia, we've got four controlled trials now. Um, but sadly, for mood disorders, depression, bipolar, things like that, um, there doesn't seem to be a great effect unless there's an anxiety component. And I'll tell you a little bit um, more um, about that as we talk more. Um, but so not as much evidence yet, or, and we need to develop um, ways of, of treating mood disorders with VR. All right, so, and um, although these studies have been around a lot, uh, a, a long time, the application in clinical practice is fairly new because we didn't have access to platforms and um, the technology to do it, and now that's becoming available with different platforms. We have one that we just started using a couple years ago in our VR um, clinic, um, which makes it really easy, and providers in like an hour or two can really become pretty proficient at it if they know how to do exposure therapy and other, and they know the protocol. So, um, uh, uh, a few of these platforms actually have all the evidence-based protocols, so it's um, um, nice standardized care um, with an evidence base. Um, and so let's talk about each of the disorders and um, the evidence for them in a little bit more detail so you can get an idea of what actually happens if you went in for VR therapy. Um, and, I, and one thing I want to say, too, is... VR is just a tool in therapy, just like a Kleenex box, I think of it, just like a chair um, uh, would be. Um, and so most of the therapy um, requires that you have a good therapeutic alliance. The research shows that you, so the relationship between the provider and the patient is most important. You need to have goals. You need to be aligned on the goals and the tasks. Um, you need to also make sure that you've got relapse prevention and a supportive system. Um, and so um, there are many interventions you can deliver, inter interpersonal skills training, um, motivational um, interviewing. Um, but the, the treatment in VR is just one component of the therapy. So um, really in practice, it might be 5% of what you're doing. We're not sticking people in to therapy and leaving the room and letting the VR do the therapy. I have a lot of people who think that that, that might be the case. Um, it's very curated, and it's, it's a very small percentage of what you do, and it's more like a tool of, of um, psychotherapy. So anxiety disorders, I'll start with that since we have the most evidence base here, and about a third of people are affected at, in their lifetime um, at some point with, with an anxiety disorder. Um, so it's a, quite a public health issue, um, and the standard treatment is psychotherapy, 
um, medications and complementary um, health approaches. And most of the psychotherapy does um, require that you have an exposure component to it in order to improve. And let me tell you, let me tell you why. So most anxieties, so I'm just going to give you the principles so you don't, we don't have to get into the details of everything, but the principle with anxiety disorders and treatment is that all anxiety is maintained due to avoidance and safety behaviors. Um, so you may think, oh, well, you know, the person's just catastrophizing and thinking incorrectly. Um, that's true, but really what's maintaining um, anxiety is behavior and avoidance behaviors. The thoughts might have an avoidance component. So um, I will, so this, it might have been actually a, a good thing to be anxious um, if you're in the savanna and you see uh, a lion and you, you run, you avoid, that's adaptive. Um, and then you, the more you, um, when you go near um, the place where you saw the lion um, or the cave, you stay away, you get your family and your friends to move away, you get more and more afraid of lions and you survive. That's an adaptive um, um, positive feedback loop. But most of um, daily life now, um, you can um, get cued in and get this positive uh, feedback loop going that's not, that's maladaptive. For example, I was on a plane ride when my, when my kids were little and um, we had a very turbulent flight, um, like six hours of this severe turbulence. I had these little babies and the, the um, flight attendants never said a thing. The pilot didn't say anything for like six hours. We were in pure terror. And so I, and then 9-11 came along. And so I didn't go on a plane for like three years after that. I was so um, traumatized. And so, but, and then when I did start going on the planes, I was so hypervigilant, making sure everything's okay, um, um, making sure we're on the shortest flight possible. I was doing all sorts of avoidance behavior. So of course I got more and more anxious. And so I wanted to get out of that. So what did I do? I started to fly more, and I knew these principles, and so I knew that I had to stop gripping really tightly whenever there was um, turbulence. I needed to act the opposite, um, and I needed to stop being so hypervigilant. I needed to you know, watch um, uh, uh, um, movies and do what I would normally do if I wasn't scared, and so I got about 85% better. But then I was still 15% anxious. I wasn't back to my baseline. So I thought, what am I doing that still is safety behavior? So I had to, um, I realized that every time there was turbulence, I had this safety behavior in my mind. I'm like, okay, I hope, I hope the, um, the pilots are really thinking about how to make this as smooth as possible. They've got to control the plane really hard. Um, and so I would do this mental gymnastics. And then I, I realized that I didn't know anything about turbulence. I didn't know how to, I would never watch movies or, um, or anything about turbulence or planes. So I started watching more movies and I found out that turbulence, you actually need to stop controlling the plane to make it smoother. The more you control, the more turbulent things get. So I started to uh, um, not be afraid of learning about airplanes, and then every time there was turbulence, I'd think, oh, just relax. I hope they're not controlling the plane. And then the last 15% of my um, flight phobia went away, and I'm not afraid anymore. So that there was little tiny avoidance behaviors that are beyond your consciousness that you have to, you have to um, figure out and let go of. Um, and so that is maybe an example of how anxiety disorders work. And so over time, you can see, so after that turbulent flight. Um, it took me probably, you know, four or five years to get back to down with my exposures. So habituation and desensitization. So exposure techniques involve, um, um, you can do them in three ways. So usually therapists will start with an imaginal component where you talk about um, what happened or you talk about um, facing the thing that you're afraid of, or you talk about how you're going to let go of your safety behaviors or your avoidance, then that's imaginal exposure. So that's some, some amount of exposure. 
Um, and then um, most, if you don't have uh, virtual reality, you would go right into in vivo exposure, um, where the, the therapist after a while is like, okay, now you're ready to go out and face the thing that you're afraid of. Um, and it's a big jump between imagining and then going out into the real world and um, exposing yourself to what you're afraid of. And so people, there's a 25% dropout rate for exposure because it, it hurts, it's hard, and it's scary. Um, and so um, there does seem to be some evidence that if you have a mid middle um, step, this in virtuo, you can increase the likelihood that um, a person gets to do the in vivo or it maybe even um, quicken it and you also have your therapist in the room to help you cope. So when you have an imaginal, um, you do an imaginal exposure, then you add um, a, a virtual or in virtuo, because you can do it on a television screen or you can do it in an immersive environment, um, then you can um, have coaching, you can desensitize even more before you actually go do the in vivo. I think I would have got better a lot faster if I had had the, um, the virtual reality to help me actually. And I could have done it, you know, who can afford to fly more than weekly? Because usually you need uh, weekly exposure to desensitize, and that's why airplane flying is so difficult. But you, if you had, when you have a virtual experience, you don't have to, you know, go broke doing your exposure. Um, okay, and then so um, VR for anxiety disorders. So as, as I said, um, there's a lot of evidence. So PTSD, OCD, and generalized anxiety are also considered anxiety disorders um, often. We clump those together. Um, and I, I don't know why, because um, there's a lot of pilot data for OCD, and people do use virtual reality for OCD, but there aren't any um, uh, controlled trials yet. Same, same for um, generalized anxiety. Um, so what we know from the studies, they're still a bit underpowered. Um, and um, they do all appear to be uh, similar, the results to standard um, CBT, so it looks like they're not inferior to uh, CBT, but as I said, the, it looks like the dropout rates might be a little less uh, when you do um, VR. Um, and so here would be an, an environment that we would use maybe for fear of public speaking um, in the office, and we can adjust you know, you can have a medium grade, um, you can have a, an easy level maybe with two people in the room that are really positive, or you can adjust it to the high level advanced where you're in a big room and people are, are um, judgmental or negative or even walking out of the room. Um, and then the other thing that's very, um, I think that's actually more useful and I use more than these protocols is um, having people pick the content that's specific to them. So this is personalized, precise medicine happening right here, where a person can find the cue, because often these are idiosyncratic sorts of fears, where it could be you know, a, you know, a yellow bookshelf or something, and you're not going to have a whole protocol for that, and people can find their cues, um, download them in the VR360, and then they I will either give them a cardboard to take home or they buy one of these and they can do all sorts of exposures all day long at home with their specific cue. Um, so that's kind of how um, we're, um, we're using it in the, in the clinics. So the other um, very robust research um, topic has been eating disorders. Um, and we do, although we're not, um, we have a study going on now. I have some um, collaborators and who, who are um, um, about to study and about to launch a um, study uh, looking at VR-enhanced CBT for eating disorders. But basically, eating disorders, one in 20 people have been affected at some point in their lives. And I think um, the, the standard treatment um, that we know works is cognitive behavior therapy, um, as well as, as uh, wellness and nutritional counseling. But I am, you know, glossing over the, the details of this just for the sake of time. But um, it's basically CBT and nutritional counseling. And what the eating disorder specialists tell me is that um, many times the behaviors get better, 
but what's hard to treat is the body image and the body dissatisfaction that's, that remains. And that is a risk factor for going back to these behaviors. So um, VR has a, a couple advantages in um, treating eating disorders, we think, is that um, not only can it help people reduce their behaviors towards food, so you can either get somebody practice um, inhibiting their response to food, or you can get them practicing stopping restricting, because everybody's different. Some people are restricting too much, some people are in, engaging too much with food. Um, and you can use VR to get them to practice those behaviors. But then the other um, helpful thing is that you can um, have them work with their um, cognitive distortions about their size, this especially for anorexia nervosa. Um, uh, there are some programs that help people um, estimate what they look like and then compare it. And I'll show you in one of our programs where you can do that. Um, we haven't started delivering this, but other researchers and clinicians have um, do use this. Um, and then the other thing, and I'm going to tell you a bit more when we get to embodied VR, but there is some evidence that we can actually reduce body dissatisfaction by updating implicit biases towards our body. So, um, but I'll tell you more of the details there. So here's um, one of the things that we're using, or we will be using in the clinic um, for the top one is um, for having people estimate their body size. And the bottom is a restaurant and different foods that you can um, program in. So um, schizophrenia and psychosis and paranoid delusions. What does that have to do with VR? Wouldn't VR you know, be contraindicated for this um, um, population. I, I usually thought, you know, they're not in touch with, re with reality. Why, why should we um, um, deliver something that's going to um, be more out of touch with reality? But actually, there is some really good um, options. And as many as three in 100 people have um, suffer at some point in their life with psychosis. So um, it's not rare. Um, the um, psychotherapy um, medications, of course, um, are important, um, but we also know that cognitive behavior therapy is quite important and helpful for, th for three things. One thing is for um, reappraising. So um, people with psychotic disorders need to know how to reappraise and do reality testing. I don't know if anyone saw um, A Beautiful Mind. So... Um, um, John Nash, the economics Nobel laureate um, who suffered with psychosis, um, learned that his hallucinations didn't age, and that's how he could know that somebody was actually a hallucination. So there's things like that, the, the cognitive um, uh, reappraisal that's important to do. Um, and then the second part is distress tolerance. People have to deal and accept a lot of their hallucinations and symptoms that can't be reversed. And so distress tolerance is important. So using um, VR to help with um, learning skills to tolerate distress. And then lastly, there's um, the um, executive functioning problems and there um, is cognitive enhancement therapy with computers um, um, practicing um, that help um, uh, help with that cognitive functioning that's involved with psychosis often. So um, there have been now four controlled trials, um, mostly looking at social skills training and decreasing paranoia, um, and that and they have um, shown um, uh, cognition and functioning is reduced, um, and uh, also. Um, self-efficacy, and interestingly, they had one group that was a VR plus, um, it was social, it was vocational training plus VR, and vocational training plus group, and the VR did better than the group. Um, so there was a comparison study, which is kind of still rare at this point. Um, and, um, yeah, and also um, there's a randomized control trial showing that it improves persecutory delusions. So um, lots of um, potential 
Um, they are, we are not delivering it yet, but we have Kate Hardy, um, who is uh, one of the directors of the Inspire Clinic, who is very um, uh, interested and in starting to develop a way that we could deliver this. So it should be coming down the pipelines in our clinics at some point. Um, and so this is just an example of one of the studies showed the difference, and this is probably too busy of a slide, I apologize. Um, one, so they compared virtual reality exposure when they just exposed them to what they're afraid of um, and didn't ask them to decrease their safety behaviors. And that, that virtual reality exposure did not do as well as exposing them to what they're afraid of and having them stop their behaviors and do something different. So it's really important, not only is just to expose yourself to the behaviors, but to actually um, let go and have an alternate behavior in response. I hope that makes sense. Um, okay, and then so um, these are some of the um, scenarios that people use when they're treating um, psychosis with VR. Um, alcohol and addiction, um, there's potential to, to treat that now, um, helping people do um, uh, uh, refusal skills in the session. Um, there's some controversy about desensitization to, to cues. Some people worry about um, you could possibly um, cue someone um, or create a craving. Um, but I think most of the time, um, People um, who have studied this have found that the cue de desensitization is, is helpful. Um, mood disorders, um, like major depression and dysthymia, as I said, there's not a great evidence base, although we can extrapolate to um, delivering mindfulness and relaxation skills. So we know that uh, um, relaxation and mindfulness skills uh, um, Although they help the acceptability of anxiety treatments, they don't actually influence the outcome. Um, but that's the opposite with mood disorders, that actually um, relaxation and um, mindfulness training actually improve and can be a treatment and affect outcome. So um, you can deliver, and, and like I said, they don't have to listen to me droning on about how to do progressive muscle relaxation. They can have an experience. And it also reduces the burden on the physician. Um, and physician wellness is a big, big um, issue, especially in psychiatry. I can get my note done. The electronic record isn't you know, while well, somebody's having their experience, I can finish my note, I can be in a better um, frame of mind, which translates to better outcomes for the patients as well. So, yeah, so we've got in our clinic progressive muscle relaxation, diaphragmatic breathing, mindfulness, um, and then pain reduction for oncology patients. That's um, um, being developed right now in our inpatient um, units. And so here's our clinic. Um, we have a website um, with the, um, how to get referred. So you can definitely Google it and check out uh, check out our clinic. Um, but let's get to the other juicy part. So that's all, that's all old stuff. Um, but what about this new embodied virtual reality? Well, what the heck is that? And why is why is virtual reality getting so much attention? Well, because I think we're having um, there's I, I don't want to. I don't think we can overstate this, but we now have the ability to inhabit another body and feel like we're in another body um, with a simulation. And I think this is the um, first time in history we've been able to have a body transfer experience, um, which is going to open up a lot of different things. Um, and why this is so different is that, although it's the same kind of tracking, um, just like the head gets tracked, it um, adds in body tracking by using sensors um, on the wall, although that's changing. Some of them will now not be even having sen sensors, and now we're even, we have a cordless version of this. So before, you could only have these embodiment experiences in multi-million dollar labs here. Jeremy Balenson at the Virtual Human Interaction Lab uh, was one of the pioneers. Um, but now we are able to bring this into the offices and anywhere due to this commercial gaming devices, um, Oculus Rift, um, HTC Vive, 
um, down in the right corner, that's where we, we use the, um, for my study, we use that. Um, and so what's, so what's so different about this compared to um, you know, the traditional? Well, um, usually visual reality um, has movement involved. Um, and so when you take body movement and you inform a virtual um, generated um, computer simulation, you not only can change cognition and emotion, but you now have access to um, changing sensation and actual movement. And I'll ex try to explain this a little better. But sensation and movement are intimately linked in a feedback loop. And um, so these avatar experiences are available on, on gaming devices now and different um, programs. You can, there's one program, um, High Fidelity, where you can go pick your body, design your body, it's free of charge, and you meet people from all over the world. I mean, this is just weird. Um, and so there, you can imagine the, the things that are available now that you could practice being somebody that you're not. I mean, there's psychotherapy role, a lot of psychotherapy is role playing, um, embodied um, experiences. Um, so they, they're using it now in medicine, not in psychiatry, but for stroke rehab, motor skills training and simulations, Parkinson's disease and cerebral palsy. Um, the first um, experience of embodied VR therapy was actually Ramachandran's mirror therapy where they amputated a phantom limb using a mirror. That, that's really embodied virtual reality when you think about it, a very crude form of it. Um, and so why, why and how this works is that pain and sensation um, respond to lack of movement. So you can imagine if you're on the savanna, you break your arm, you feel a lot of pain, and then your arm is not moving. And, and the more it doesn't move, the more the brain's like, this is really serious, don't move the arm, send more pain, um, because that arm needs to heal and you don't wanna use it. And so movement, um, the lack of movement, visual, when you see something not, the reptilian brain picks up on disuse and it increases pain. And so this is good when you're healing, right? But, um, and it's this positive feedback loop and it allows you to recover. But people can get into these chronic pain loops uh, with disuse. So the more you don't use something, the more pain you feel, the more you don't use it. Um, or you have a stroke and you don't use something, you get these weird pain and sympathetic um, dystrophies and um, inflammation that starts to occur. And the way out of that, for all the pain specialists that I talk to, they say movement is the first indication of pain getting better. So if you see movement, if your brain sees movement, it says, oh, okay, things are not that bad. Let's turn down the pain. And so you can it decrease pain and sensation. So that's just an example of how sensation and movement and visual information is um, connected. But many there's many other systems in the body, the, the immune system, and I'll talk to you a little bit later, that are, uh, that are connected this way. So the ability to have movement um, really is a game changer. So um, there are many disuse syndromes that mirror therapy has been shown to be quite um, helpful with. I won't bore you with all the details, but they're disuse syndromes that are unilateral disuse syndromes. Um, and so that's what made me interested. I have a lot of patients with um, psychosomatic illness. Um, they'll have paralysis or weakness many times on one side. Um, and so that got me interested in using mirror therapy. And then um, I collaborated with Jeremy Balenson's lab and we, it was right at the time that the HTC Vive was coming out and we were able to replicate what was going on in Jeremy's lab and do a mirror visual feedback and do mirror therapy in embodied, um, embodied um, 
virtual reality. And so we're now, um, so we're um, two years into the study and we've got another year and um, we're doing a randomized control trial to see if it helps with psychosomatic illness. So um, what else, what, what else, what's so great about um, embodied virtual reality? Well, I wanna convince you that um, we're in brand new territory um, by talking about some of the research that's been done, and this has been done with embodiment and illusions, because before we didn't have access to um, all, um, these new commercial gaming devices. Um, and so we, we know a bit about the nervous system from these illusions. And the, for, and the most um, notorious and the one that we have the most data is called the rubber hand illusion. And I think it will inform us um, about um, virtual reality. So let me just show this to you. So a picture's worth a thousand words. Hi, Position the rubber hand so it looks I'm like it's your own. Okay. okay, could you imagine that being your own hand, kind of? Yeah. What we're going to do is we're going to just stroke your finger okay. simultaneously, the rubber finger and your real finger, and hopefully this will convince you that the uh, rubber hand is your own, that your brain will actually adopt this hand. In the illusion, simply watching the rubber hand being stroked at the same time as the it's real hand again. is enough to good. trick the brain into adopting it as its own. Well, we like weird. <laughs> and slowly but surely, you should feel that the hand you're looking at is actually part of your body. Feels like you're touching my hand with that one. Right, so it feels like this is your hand that I'm yes. touching, right? Yes. with your kids. Yeah. The rubber hand illusion is a wonderful example of how multisensory perception can influence how we perceive our own body. Yeah. So I just wanted to, so you understand what um, that illusion is. And let me go back to. Um, and so people have different propensity for this. Some people. Um, have this experience with the rubber hand illusion. Some people don't have it. And it seems to be a marker of interoceptive sensation. And intero problems with interoceptive sensation are a marker for emotion regulation. So people that have emotion regulation issues um, can more easily um, get immersed and embodied in these. Um, so what... Uh, so it, it can be a marker. I think we can start to use virtual reality um, and possibly measure things in psychiatric illness. The other thing that's a little disturbing is that we don't know very much about this. One of this um, researcher, Damasio, has demonstrated that um, the hand that's being disembodied during the rubber hand illusion actually starts to have an immune response and the body starts to reject that. So the visual system and the immune system are also intimately related. People with trauma dissociate. Um, in a sense, they, they are also um, um, having, um, are more easily taking into these kind of immersive experiences. So um, it, although it's a, it's a marker of kind of plasticity and probably we develop this because of tool use, um, we've never been able to have these such robust kinds of illusions, and we don't know what the effects are going to be, and we need to be very careful. Um, these aren't regulated devices, um, and so, um, and the safety is unclear, and I think that we need the medical community to also be very careful in using these, and these are for the embodied. I think we're pretty safe on the the headsets, the, the virtual reality, with, but everything after that is, we're in a big experiment right now, and I think we need to know that we're in an experiment. Um, and th the FDA is thinking about regulating these devices, which I think they should. 
um, uh, the but I think what's uh, really coming we're coming to terms with is that this visual capture there's this dominance of the um, visual system um, and that things are possible that we don't even know yet where um, Jeremy's Balenson's lab has shown that we can actually learn to control an eight armed lobster you can actually become a lobster and learn how to <laughs> control that um, so the exploratory uses right now um, are mere therapy um, integration with biofeedback physical therapy body image disorders um, and there are cases of people um, improving their body dissatisfaction just by swapping um, bodies so people with obesity um, swap for a very thin body and once they leave the um, environment, they actually feel more satisfied with their body. You would think it'd be the opposite, right? But And then that seems to translate to um, health behaviors. Um, there's uses for teletherapies for because most of communication, about 80% of communication is nonverbal. You lose a lot if you're doing telepsychiatry and just a screen. Um, you only get a limited amount of information, including eye gaze and things that are important for attachment. Um, so uh, doing um, telepsychiatry in VR will probably be another um, possible novel use. Um, and then I think um, most important will be, um, you know, having a mindfulness exercise in an embodied experience is going to be even more um, immersive and interactive and retain. You're going to learn even more probably and, and enhance learning. Um, and um, and then the, lastly, and then I'm finishing up now, um, is the ability to reprogram implicit bias and um, re reprogram some of our unconscious belief systems. So Jeremy um, Balenson's lab is really the ones who coined the term Proteus effect. So when when you inhabit an avatar with certain traits, you you change your beliefs about those traits. Um, so they, uh, I think one of their first experiments was um, with superheroes. So if one, um, uh, they had an option where you could either inhabit a superhero or a non-superhero. And then if you inhabit the superhero, after the experiment, um, they recorded people helping people more. Um, and um, when they do this on, on gender and race, they actually show from implicit um, biased um, testing that their implicit bias has changed after they've they've inhabited the body of that characteristic. So it, it could be a force for good and maybe not not good in that um, a lot of this is passive reprogramming, um, you know, with maybe without your consent. Um, but there there are um, biases, implicit biases that we can reprogram, and a lot of. Um, um, psychiatric illnesses have some elements of implicit bias. Um, we can do um, this theory of mind where some of disorders like autism have um, impairment in being able to understand the mind of the other. We can do training with forced allocentric viewpoints, um, maybe have people practice empathy training, um, uh, having people um, change their implicit um, beliefs about themselves and about others. Um, and then um, as far as body, there's this allocentric lock theory. I'm hoping I can describe it well. Um, it's a little bit complicated, but basically there's an egocentric view of ourselves that we have that comes from information coming down, my, my internal sensations, my interoceptive sensations, um, will inform me of what my body looks like, what it feels like. But then we also, our body perception is coming from the outside. What do other people think I look like? Um, am I fat? Am I too tall? Am I too um, short? Um, you have this idea of what the world thinks of you. Um, and you, you, uh, you're, you have a model of who, who you are and, and your body based on information coming up and information coming down. And from uh, some psychiatric disorders appear that the allocentric viewpoint is dominating the, um, 
the viewpoint of your body. It's not updating the models correctly. So someone, uh, for example, who's very thin, uh, is, um, struggling with anorexia, might feel fat even though they look down, they see that they're thin, but this allocentric viewpoint is, is um, overriding that. Um, so we can, people with body dysmorphia, um, there may be ways to change um, um, by inhabiting, there's evidence mounting that by inhabiting these avatars, we can update models about the body. Um, so that's kind of exciting. Um, but again, it's all exploratory at this point. I don't think we can say anything for sure, but these are the things that are being um, explored. Uh, um, and then one last thing, just notes of caution. So. The, so some of the barriers are cost. We don't get reimbursed anymore, uh, any, anything more for using these technologies, so it's unclear who's going to pay for them or whether. I mean, the cost is pretty low at this point, but um, like when I do psychotherapy, I'm not getting any more um, RVUs or um, um, payment for using virtual reality as opposed to not doing it. Um, some people uh, have perceived difficulty with technology. There is a 1% chance of cyber sickness, um, and there's also visual disturbances, postural instability, uh, lucid dreaming, which I guess could be a positive or a negative. Um, and there are gamers that are talking about, and usually this is for you know hours or days of using, who will wake up and have reported not feeling their hands. Luckily, this is temporary, but we don't know what some of the side effects may be. So really, we're recommending most um, devices are recommending not more than 20 to 30 minutes of use. Um, so there's a limit to how long you can be in VR. Um, especially in these embodied experiences, it does look like that people who have migraines or um, um, children um, or people who have uh, cyber sickness within the first 10 minutes of use um, are at increased um, risk. Um, but there are ways to manage it with better content, um, you know, pacing people, having them spend longer. Um, less time and having providers who let people out of the simulation whenever they notice it. So there'll need to be some training. So anyway, if you're interested in more, you can look up on our, on our um, VRIT uh, website what's, what's happening in our department. Okay, so, well, I went a little longer than I thought, but now we're open for questions. Did you mean yeah. to say that uh the disembodied limb, the immune system doesn't work in the limb and still works in the rest of the body at the same time? Yeah, they, they report histamine. Oh, yeah. So it, you're asking um, the, the immune response is working fine in the rest of the body but not in the limb that's disembodied. And I and my you were asking that as a question, and I'm saying yes. It look, it's a histamine response that appears very localized in that area. Yes, yes, yeah, good. Yeah, I th I'm kind of intrigued by that, yeah. I've heard about embodied VR being used for sort of having conversations with the self, so having like a self-therapy session, mm -hmm. and I'm interested in that and what your thoughts are on how, what the applications could be. <coughs> yeah, me too. Um, I know there was this report there, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, there's, um, there are reports of using embodied VR for self-therapy. Um, and um, yes, I um, have heard, uh, heard about that, and I am very interested in that. There was a podcast recently about a researcher who did um, a, a program called Freud, which I'm trying to get my hands on, in which um, you will go into the experience and you see a picture of, of Freud, and you go in and you tell him your problem. And then you, um, instead of Freud answering, you go in and you are Freud and you listen to yourself. Uh, so from that um, ego, uh, allocentric point of view, and people have found that they, they can see things differently and reappraise things in that. So yeah, yeah, I think that's gonna be great. Or empty chair technique, a lot of things we do 
in psychotherapy are actually embodied. We use our imagination to um, embody. But I, I think that's good because a lot of times when people are emotionally dysregulated, they can't access their emotion. They can't ima- um, access their imagination. Or I see people with like TBI, um, traumatic brain injuries, and they just they just have a lot of problems imagining. And so this is sort of like a prosthetic imagination for them, for people that... Um, does that answer your question? Okay. Or do you know of anything else? That's no, I was, I, I, yeah. actually a great episode on Radio Lab. If yeah. 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 I highly recommend it. It's really fascinating because it takes you through this person who has experience talking to themselves as Freud. And it's, yeah, it's very cool. Yeah. I have a student trying to track it down. We want to try to use it in our clinic. Yeah, in the red. Um, I had heard some information. It was very limited, but um, I have chronic vertigo and mm. that VR could help with people who have chronic vertigo. Have you heard anything about that? I've yeah. heard something, but I don't know the details, but it, it makes sense to me. As a, oh, sorry. The, um, um, the woman um, in the red said that she'd heard of, um, she has chronic vertigo and has heard of VR being used for that. Um, uh, and I have heard of it, but I don't remember the details, but I would think, yeah, it's a motor and sensory um, phenomenon and uh, an illusion might definitely be something that could could help. Yeah. And I, I know there's a there's very um, um, effective protocols for vertigo, and maybe they could also, um, automatize it into VR. That would be another option. Yeah, because I know there's very good treatments for vertigo and um, protocols. Um, ENT, yeah, and ear, nose, and throat. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in the back. You were mentioning about executive functioning and mm-hmm. improving that. Uh, has it had any experience with ADD on that? Uh, with VR? Um, Possible. Oh, yeah. So is there any evidence of um, improvement in executive functioning in ADD using VR? Possibly, but I don't know all the research. Yeah, um, it's possible there is. Um, And yeah, I would think that there's all sorts of ways that you could um, help. um, Oh, we do have a researcher actually in our department who's looking at using VR and biofeedback for kids with ADHD. So I know I know people are exploring it, but and I'm sorry, I'm just not an expert in that field, so I don't know. But uh, yeah. Um, you hit a lot on all exposure techniques. So mm-hmm. it seems like all of this is exposure. What's the next step into interactive? Mm. So um, yeah, you're saying um, this question was um, that we, I talked a lot about exposure, but what about the next step with interaction? Uh, can you say more? What do you mean? What do you think? Well, I mean, I guess some of the things that you were showing were stepping into interactive where the Freud or um, some of the, the feedback. I'm, I was looking more of the interactive into the actual imagery of the brain or the body and mm. how how neurosurgeons, but I know this is a whole different mm-hmm. thing, so this is psychiatry, but where maybe with the body sense, the body image, where they are interactively working with their previous body image and what they want to be or what is going to be healthy for them. Yeah. So where, where is, is it more exposure research still going on, or are they really starting to push into no, I think, yeah, uh, people are just doing just wild things. And we have vendors. So once a month we have a meeting, a consortium meeting, and so uh, where vendors come and show us um, things that are being developed and researchers. Just It's just a kind of collaborative process of exploring what's out there. And people d- are doing all sorts of interactive things with mindfulness and body uh, body scans and, where, and drawing where your emotions are and... Um, social um, uh, sorts of experiences. So I, I, yeah, I think uh, exposure, uh, we all know it works, we could use it, and I think this is the next phase. Um, you know, how can you embody um, maybe somebody that's um, having gender dysphoria 
um, that that could um, be uh, one of the treatments um, as they get maybe if somebody's going through um, an, um, uh, change um, and getting used to uh, things like that. I mean, there's so many options, yeah. Or did you have something in mind that? Um, it, it's more on the, the surgical side. I see, yeah, yeah. There's, so there's a lot of surgical simulation. They're way ahead of us than in psychiatry, so there's, yeah. That's uh, lots and lots of training that's going on with surgical simulation. Yeah. Um, with virtual reality and mindfulness, mm -hmm. what, what do they do? And is it something you can do at home and buy the little glasses, or it's something you have to do in a psychiatrist's office? No, they're, they're, yeah, that's probably one of the most popular apps, um, our mindfulness apps. There's things like Zen Zone, and I mean, there's just millions. Um, that, that seems to be the most popular intervention. So, um, but we, a lot of them haven't been tested either. We don't know, you know, if it's equivalent to the mindfulness training, the randomized control trials have used with depression. So, um, but yeah, I mean, it's being developed. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yes, I have okay. a bipolar son who won't do anything, and I'm just trying to look for ways to get him to do something. Mm -hmm. He probably won't do anything anyway, but. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite ones is this one that um, you, um, a lot of people have trouble focusing on breathing. Um, and so it shows you, you're in a peaceful setting in nature, and it it shows you how to do your breath, the, the pattern of your breath. Um, you can set it at different patterns, and you see the breath, you just see the smoke going in and out, and I can feel my breath much more when I can see the breath coming in and out, and it guides me, because uh, I've never got it from a yoga teacher who tells me to breathe. I'm like, what am I doing? I can't feel my breath. But there is an interoceptive sensation, so there's things like that that I think is novel that are going to be developed. But again, I'm not an expert. There's probably a lot more to it. Uh -huh. Regard to visual reality, for everyday life, most people are not in tracking visual reality. But 10 years from now, most people are going to be in tracking. So basically, you're going to buy something, and you, uh, the cashier is a visual reality. So how would the effect mm -hmm. changes based on how much we are being more involved? Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. How, so how would this affect treatment if, if virtual reality is like so ubiquitous and we're kind of desensitized to it? Will it change anything? I don't know. Yeah, maybe we'll be desensitized. Maybe we won't learn as well because I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> Is something like is it like a color TV compared to black and white? Yeah. Because a day-to-day -day life, people don't yeah. aren't using it. But when yeah. all the games become virtual reality, all the training and tutorial become virtual reality, then yeah. you go to the treatment and just like it's the same thing. They say, okay, I go to the bank, it's almost the same thing. What's the difference? Yeah, yeah. But it'll probably still be specific enough. It'll be better than doing, I guess, regular, maybe. Um, maybe it'll, um, but you probably need to do both. I mean, eventually you have to do in vivo reality exposure. So it's just a step to do the real exposure. Um, but I don't know. Yeah, those are interesting questions. <laughs> yeah, in the back. Uh -huh. um, when you talked about the pain sensation mechanism, and I think you mentioned in order to decrease the pain sensation, mm -hmm. you make people see the movement, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Is there any specific movement that you show, or like, is it like random movement? Or? Uh, yeah, oh, that's a good question. So what type of movement do you um, show to decrease pain, is what you're asking? Yeah, it depends on where the person's feeling um, the pain. So um, usually you have to swap limbs. So if it's happening in the left upper limb, um, we will show it. Um, um, so if they're having pain in the left upper limb, we'll put them in virtual reality where when they're moving this hand, it looks actually like they're moving this hand. So it's a, they, they swap it, but it really depends on where the pain, you customize it to where the pain location is. But it has to be on one side. If it got it on both sides, it doesn't seem to work as well. Um, unless it's a different kind of pain on, on both sides. Yeah. Does that make sense? Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. 
Is, is there a, a source of information to, to uh, find out, find providers or clinics that use virtual reality? And if, if, there's, if there are places, how, can, how, how would we know if they are, if they have the appropriate training or accreditation? That's a good, yeah, that's a very good question. Um, so uh, the question is, um, how do we find providers who are delivering virtual reality? How do we know if they're trained and they're well-versed in, in how to deliver this? Um, we don't have any great um, uh, standard of care or clinical practices right now. Um, and there's no, no trainings that um, really standardize this. There's one company, um, Sias, who um, is probably the most um, common platform, and they do have 800 users, so they probably somewhere on their site, if you contact them, you could see who, who's doing it. But we don't know the quality of the providers. We don't know um, who's trained. We don't have training programs. That's one of the things we're uh, developing and trying to accomplish would be to get some standards of care, just like we do for regular CBT. But probably if you have somebody who's trained in cognitive behavior therapy, they're going to have most of the principles, because this is just a tool, what they're using. So uh, one good site is the um, Association of um, Cognitive and Behavioral Therapists, abct.org, and they have a Find a Therapist button. So you can find well-trained cognitive behavior therapist, and they might have a subspecialty in virtual reality. But right now, we don't have um, best practices in virtual reality. So be, care be careful. Yeah. What's I mean, would you spell it? So oh, uh, P-S-I-O-U-S is probably the most common platform now. Yeah, but still, you know, they're the calmest one. And I, I asked them the other day, I said, how many people are using it? They're like 800 in the whole world. Like, that's still small, so, yeah. Dr. Bullock, <laughs> is the technology at least stable enough to where you can develop standards of care against it, or is it forever chasing a moving target? Um, so you, the question is, is it stable enough to develop standards of care? Yeah, um, that's a good question. So, I mean, I think with the protocols, yes. So we have some protocols that we know work. But the technology, the devices, are what's changing so quickly. Um, and so, yeah, that's going to be hard to develop the standards of care. I think I would more stay. We have some standardized evidence-based interventions that have been studied in controlled trials with these headsets. But we don't have it for the immersive technology. And yeah, I think because it's moving so fast and the devices are changing, and it's is that what you're asking? That it's going to be hard to create standards with those devices. But I think we have pretty good um, evidence base. It's evidence informed right now, like, although we don't have a good training program for um, physician or for providers. I got a question as far as like the quality of graphics, like the characters are pretty basic right now. So is it um, does that affect how the user responds to that? For instance, you look in. Uh, Hollywood, mm -hmm. the characters get more and more complex as far as detail. Yeah. So. Well, yeah. There's this really interesting phenomenon. Um, um, there's um, most of the exposures. The reptilian brain doesn't is is kind of stupid. It doesn't need a lot of detail to to evoke the emotion. It just needs really basic components, like even with a spider. Um, uh, and the problem is the. Um, it, t it takes more and more money to get more and more realistic. Um, and if you're really close to realistic but not quite r realistic, you get into what's called the uncanny valley, and then it's just weird. So usually people will either keep it really simple or you got to go all the way and pour a bunch of money into it. And since the landscape's um, changing so quickly, I think people aren't pouring a lot of money into the details of it. Um, because of that investment cost, is my understanding, although I'm not a developer. Do you think uh, people would, it would be a better response? Or? I don't think it matters, to be honest, because, yeah, you're dealing with the rep uh, on exposures. I think it doesn't matter because you're dealing with their reptilian brain. Maybe on learning environments, yeah, the more engaging it is, perhaps, than the novelty. But, again, I don't know. I don't know if we have the answer to that. 
Hi, you mentioned that um, the headsets are pretty stable. Any research showing that they might be addictive for the individuals? Um, oh, that's you know, the long term effects, we don't know that yet. Yeah. I haven't seen. The, oh, yeah. So, are there any um, long term effects with addiction and um, VR? Um, oh, addiction to uh, VR. Addiction to VR. Sorry. Yeah. Are there any? Um, is there any evidence of addiction with VR? Um, I, that's a good question. I haven't looked at the literature, but I think it's similar to the gaming. Um, and I think there's a number of hours, which is actually quite long. It was quite disturbing when I read the literature on that. Um, I'm not remembering how many hours, but um, actually to be at risk for addiction, there's many, many hours of, of gaming. I think because of the cyber sickness issue, um, people should not be on for more than 20 minutes. And I, I think that they get visual um, um, fatigue more easily on there. So there's probably less risk. But again, that's a good question. You know, I think I'm going to go home and look that up, see if there's anything about it. Do you know anything about it? Or? Well, I was just yeah. curious about the research with obesity, right? So yeah. an individual maybe desires a certain body type, and they finally achieve that. And we can see a high and a positive effect short term but maybe then that becomes cyclical and then they depend on that. And then yeah. they have to go back for VR treatment, right? Yeah. Especially if, you know, 10, 20 years from now, it's everywhere and it's kind of cheap. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I kind of wonder how that would socially yeah. impact things. Right, right. And I think, yeah, we are we don't know any of this now. Yeah, we're all, we're just exploring this, but... Um, I think at the present moment, there's probably less risk because of the visual fatigue. All right. Okay. And I'm, I'm here after if anybody wants to ask any questions. Thank you, Dr. Sure.